Hey, what's going on, folks? It's Mike here, and welcome to the next lesson in the C++ series. But this, in fact, isn't a lesson where we're going to be covering any new material, but rather reviewing all the great stuff that we've been learning about classes. And I thought it'd be fun for me to reflect a little bit about the material we've been covering, as well as just interview questions that I've had related to object-oriented programming classes and some other C++ stuff. So I thought it'd be fun if we did this in the format of the American game show Jeopardy, where you are typically given an answer and have to ask the right question about the actual material. Now I've gone ahead and just made this a little bit easier. It will just be a question and answer format just so we can make things a little bit more easier as we go through the terminology. So with that said, I'm really excited. Let's go ahead and dive in and try to play a little bit of Jeopardy here. So welcome to Jeopardy, the C++ classes edition, of course, and we're going to go ahead and do a little bit of review. Now, what I'm going to go ahead and do is reveal the board here. I borrowed it from a template from this gentleman here, so some credit there that I've modified uh, since. So some rules, I'll click on a box, show a question, and then you'll have to come up with the answer. That's a little bit different than the actual format of the American uh, Jeopardy game show, but I think you will do just fine anyway. And with that said, though, what I would like you to do while we participate in this exercise is to hit the space bar as you go along, pause and actually think about the questions. And if you'd really like, maybe you'll think this is fun. Maybe if you comment below, maybe we can encourage some C++ experts to play and give their insight in the future. All right, folks, with that said, let's go ahead and start playing some Jeopardy. So let's go ahead and take a look here and I'm going to go ahead and take classes basics for 100. In fact, I'm going to go in order just to make things a little bit simple here. So first off in C++, what keywords do we use to create a user defined type? Go ahead and pause the video. And if you've paused the video and taken a moment to figure out your answer, I'm going to go ahead and click here. Well, of course, that's a class and bonus points if you also mentioned a struct as well. All right, so let's go ahead and return to the board and let's up the stakes here and take this to 200. See how well you've been learning here. So describe what a class is. You may use a concrete example. Go ahead and pause. This is a frequent question I've gotten on interviews, especially for entry level positions. And to see the answer, well, you could just describe a class of some sort of concrete type, or maybe talk about it as terms of laying out a blueprint for objects that you'd like to create or instances of objects from this particular blueprint. Architecture examples work well, for instance, talking about cars and how they're laid out and how you can have different models of cars where you set the attributes and the member functions is another nice way to approach this problem. All right, doing well so far. We've got 300, hopefully you've scored 300. Let's continue to up the stakes here for 300. What is a copy constructor? And go ahead and give you a moment to pause the video. And hopefully you've thought about this a little bit. Let's go ahead and click to see the answer. A copy constructor is a special member function that's called when an instance of an object is created from another object of the same type. Okay, so remember where these copy constructors are called. Remember how to create one with the definition. We've done a video on that previously. And how we use the class name. We make it const because we don't want to be modifying the particular object as we're making the copy. So a few things to remember there. All right, 400, getting into the more difficult questions here. What happens if you do not provide a constructor, destructor, or copy constructor when creating a class? And go ahead and think about this for a moment. Pause if you haven't already. And let's go ahead and reveal the answer here. And the answer is that the C++ compiler will provide defaults for you. So you can create some struct like this. Here's a user defined type in X and Y. You'll notice we can still initialize that object and of course set the values if we want after. But the reason that we're able to do this is because we do have a compiler defined constructor here or a default given to us. And the defaults are trivial uh, when those are compiler generated. It's just going to do the simplest thing possible and initialize some values, maybe defaults if you're lucky, but just enough memory for X and Y in this case. 
All right, let's bring it home with a $500 question to finish off this category. What is a move constructor? Okay, so something we've talked about a little bit. Another type of constructor, so something to do with building. And go ahead and pause, write down your answer, and let's go ahead and see. So move constructor is a special member function that's called when an object is initialized from some R value. Okay, so when creating a new object, this is effectively transferring ownership to our new object as we are constructing it. Okay, so you can see another example here and how we are defining this with the two ampersands, okay, to get an R value reference or something that we want to transfer ownership of. All right, so we're moving right along. That's the basics of classes. Hopefully that was a good warm up. And let's go ahead and think about some classes rules here. So what are the three special member functions in the rule of three? Now, if you've taken a moment to think about this, let's go ahead and take a look. We've got the constructor, destructor, copy constructor, and I'll even give you bonus points if you mention the copy assignment operator as part of that number three as well. So that's the rule of three, and you'd want to remember if you're doing this on an interview why you would want to follow the rule of three. That is usually if you have a user-defined constructor or if you define any one of these three things, then you want to define all of them. OK, and usually including that copy assignment operator. So sometimes we call us rule of three uh, and just slide in the copy assignment operator as well. All right, not too bad. Let's take a look at 200 here. So in what scenario do you have to provide a custom copy constructor? All right, give you a moment to think about this and maybe you could conjure up some sort of example. And maybe you'd want to think about this if you're writing some code on an interview, whether you need to do this. So let's go ahead and see the answer. Well, any time when you're performing a deep copy, okay? So anytime you have a member variable that's not trivially copyable, so nothing that's a uh, primitive type like integers, floats, chars, etc., you would need to perform a deep copy. So again, if you have some member variable that is, say, a pointer where you're allocating memory, you would need to write your copy constructor. So here's an example of that. We did a video on it here. You can follow if you'd like and to see how to do the copy constructors. All right, so that was for 200. Let's go ahead and move on to 300 and see what else we've got here. So what are the five member functions in the rule of five? Talked about the rule of three already, if you can remember. And if you've paused and thought about this, let's go ahead and check this out. And we have the constructor, destructor, copy constructor, and of course the copy assignment operator, which I'll lump in there, move constructor, which we've mentioned, and move assignment operator. Okay, those are our five special member functions of the rule of five. And again, typically where the rule of five applies is if you're going to do any sort of move constructor, that means you probably need the move assignment operator and you're gonna to have to define all these other special member functions as well. All right, so we're moving right along here. 400, when should you initialize an object with curly braces as opposed to parentheses? And we've got a little example down here that you can take a look at and see what that uh, may be. And if you've taken a moment to think about this and pause, let's go ahead and take a look here. So for the first example with the curly braces, just remember that when you're calling this type of constructor, this prevents narrowing. So for example, if this is taking in integers, if you put in floats here, then you will get a compiler error, which is a good thing for you. So especially if you know what the type is here, that this is in fact, whatever this user defined type is, um, and it's not going to be cast to some sort of value or whatever, you would want to typically use curly braces. And in addition, the other case that you need to remember is if a constructor has an initializer list, then this is going to treat this as a list uh, initializer list where it's perhaps populating some data structure with a one and two, a collection of elements. OK, so that's the first case. And the second case really is just calling the constructor with two parameters here um, and doesn't prevent narrowing. So it's not as conservative. So if I was taking in integers here, for example, and I decided to put 2.4, it would downcast that to an integer and just treat it as a two. 
Okay. So that was a big one, 400. Let's go ahead and finish off this category for 500. So what are the three uses of const? Okay, and you might think about this in terms of const correctness. All right, give you a moment to think about it and pause the video if you need. Let's go ahead and take a look at the answer. So the first use you can talk about is just a regular locally scoped variable here. That's not going to change. This is essentially just a read only value that's initialized one time. And then we also have the second case where we have a parameter. We've seen an example of this previously in our copy constructor, where we would not be able to change this particular value as it's being passed in. And often we do this for efficiency. If we have some read only value that we want to pass in by reference, this doesn't have to be by reference, but that's commonly why you would do so. And the related note to classes, what we're talking about here in today's Jeopardy game is if we have some member function that's part of a class and we mark const after that member function. That makes it read-only access um, of all the member variables. So we'll get an error if we try to modify any value there. Okay, so feel free to check out those looks there. Const correctness is a great way to improve the quality of your code. Certainly something you'd want to talk about in an interview or if you're doing some sort of uh, actual design of a class. All right, so let's see how we're doing. We've sweeped away two categories here and we're on to structs. And structs aren't classes or are they? I don't know. Let's take structs for 100 and find out. So what is the difference between a struct and a class in C++? Aha, uh -huh, OK. Uh, if we've thought about this, maybe structs were a mistake to add here in this particular uh, Jeopardy, uh, or were they? So let's go ahead and click the answer. Well, the difference between structs and classes in C++ is the default privacy level. And structs are public classes are private. That's the only difference that you have to worry about in C++. Some programmers stylistically will prefer one or the other. You might have to look in your code guide to figure out which one your company likes to use. Um, and I'll leave that to you. And maybe that's a question to ask someday. You know, bonus points if you also talked about inheritance. So that's what this example is here, where if I'm inheriting from a class, um, A, since it's a class, will um, if I'm using a struct, we'll have public um, here from B. And if I'm inheriting from a class, I'll get private inheritance. So I've tossed that in from a Stack Overflow question. Um, that could be a, a bonus point if you address that perhaps in an interview to really show that you understand inheritance as well. All right, back to the Jeopardy board. 200 uh, for structs. Why do we create separate HPP, so header files, or .h files, and .cpp files for our user-defined types. This could be something that you just think about. Again, in some of my videos, I've been breaking the rule and just putting everything in one file because it's easy to do, but in production, I would want to separate these out. Why would I want to do that? And if you've thought about that for a moment, let's go ahead and click and see the answer. So again, header files serve as an interface and just include the declaration. Usually we don't have any implementation code there. So no loops, no if statements, no logic of how we're actually implementing the algorithms in our member functions. And then of course, the rest of the header file is laying out the blueprint of that class with just the member variables, um, the attributes, and that's it. So if you had any proprietary implementation or you wanted to hide that away, that goes into the CPP file. And the CPP file or the source file is the thing that gets compiled. And again, the reason for separating these out, one could be for hiding proprietary information, but secondly, it's usually for efficiency when compiling because we only have to compile our CPP files one time, and if they don't change, we don't have to recompile them in a project when we're using build systems like make and so on. So there is reason to separate things out just into modules for distribution, hiding implementation, faster compilation, and so on, and just general uh, physical organization of our project. Okay, so feel free to review on that if you need, but let's go ahead and get back to our board, and we are entering the halfway point I'm going to make this a daily double for you. I'll give you 600 if you get this one correct. 
All right, so structs for 300. What does RAII stand for? Okay, go ahead and think about it. It's a very weird acronym. Some in the C++ community even say it was poorly named. <laughs> but let's go ahead and see the answer. And it stands for resource acquisition is initialization. So a really, really important concept in C++, this idea that when you create a class is when you want to acquire resources that you need in the constructor. So that could be memory. That's usually what we're thinking about, but it could also be uh, a handle for a file, maybe opening a lock or something if you're using concurrency. Um, any resource should be acquired in the constructor and then in the destructor. So when the lifetime of the object ends, that's when you free that resource, whether it's a memory, releasing a file handle, releasing a lock. In this way, our code's safe when we have things like exceptions that are thrown in our code, for instance, because we have a guarantee that uh, a destructor will be called at some point to destroy an object and free resources. Okay, so RAII, perhaps the most single important concept in C++, um, at least from the object-oriented uh, perspective, this idea that we have these defined lifetimes of our objects. It's actually a really great thing in the language. All right, so that takes us halfway through. Hopefully you're uh, head is exploding with knowledge here and you're enjoying the review here. Uh, let's go ahead and jump to structs for 400. So what is a pod type? So continuing with some of the acronyms here, not that I like acronyms, but you just need to be able to speak the language a little bit um, in the C++ community. So what is a pod type? So let's go ahead and take the answer here. Hopefully you've thought about it. And I'll accept at least two answers here, but a plain old data type or piece of data. Now, historically, again, the C++ language comes from C, which had structs. Uh, in the C language, structs did not have member functions uh, or methods, um, if you're coming from other languages, which meant that um, they were really just a composite type with a listing of variables or pointers, maybe function pointers or whatever, um, with them. So some C++ programmers also treat structs as plain old data types and will use them for things where they just want a composite type with only member variables. Okay, so that's a stylistic thing, uh, but just something that you might run into and should know. All right, let's take structs for 500 and finish off this category. So what is operator overloading? And name some specific operators you can overload. Okay, go ahead and think about this. I think in your answer, you might want to think about why you might want to do this, what good use cases are, or perhaps bad use cases, and perhaps some unique operators that you can overload and why they might be helpful. So hopefully you've paused and thought about this a little bit. Let's go ahead and take a look at the answer. So operator overloading allows you to define operators plus, minus, less than, or equal to the stream operators, even things like new and delete for functions and classes. Okay, so the more important thing is why would you want to do this? Well, oftentimes it might be more natural for perhaps data types if you have a vector three, the sort of mathematical vector um, class or a matrix or something like this, it might make sense to have these operators overloaded, at least the algebraic types, you know, plus, minus, and so on. It can also be useful if you need to override new and delete, for instance, and that way you could do things like tracking memory or allocations for that particular object. That's a particular use case that I've used here. Okay, so that's uh, operator overloading can be a handy feature um, depending on your uh, style of code. All right, so that finishes off structs. Let's go ahead and dive into inheritance here. So is inheritance an is a or has a relationship? And I bet you got that one like this. A quick answer here. It is an is a relationship for inheritance and has a for composition, just as a note there. So we've looked at this quite a bit um, in our inheritance series, and that's what you want to think of it as really an is a inheritance. And again, think about the reasons why you use inheritance. It's often sure for code reuse so you don't have to duplicate code but 
you're doing that because something truly is a, a uh, type or in that sort of family of objects that you're creating this this hierarchy so you can take advantage of things like uh, inheritance based polymorphism which is just something to keep in your mind all right let's go ahead and take a look at uh, class inheritance for 200 here so in what order are the constructors and destructors called when creating a new golden here so I'll give you a moment to look at this code here. We've got this dog uh, object here, which has at least a constructor defined. And as we've learned, a default destructor would be compiler generated for us. And if we come down here, we've got a golden, which is derived from dog here. So that means what in terms of this question? So if you need to go ahead and run, uh, pause the video, run off and code this, but even better yet, think about how this might work. All right, and let's go ahead and take a look at the answer. And the answer is we would have the dog constructor called first, because that is the base class. The golden constructor would be called next. Then we do things in the opposite order. We destroy the golden, and then we would destroy the dog here. And that's actually a little typo which I will fix there. So there we are, dog destructor here. So this is the order here. And it sort of is this um, uh, reverse order of constructing things. Now, something else you might want to think about, which um, I will admit is not on the Jeopardy board, is what order objects are destroyed um, and, well, constructed, I suppose, if you're just creating objects in general that are stack allocated. Again, something to think about. This question's in the slide deck because I've had it as an interview question for C++ positions. All right, let's go ahead and move on to a $300 question here. What is virtual function in C++? And what is this meaning here? And I'll let you think about it. Hopefully you have. Let's go ahead and take a look at the answer. And the answer is virtual is the C++ way of supporting dynamic dispatch. Okay, so what is dynamic dispatch? Again, it comes back to this idea of if I have different types that have a is a relationship, so they're in that uh, family, and I want those objects to perhaps be created um, or from one of the uh, base types, create a new drive type, and well, I need some way to figure out at runtime which, again, member functions will be called for the right object. Okay, so again, this is necessary to uh, another cleaner way to state that is to say this is necessary to ensure that the correct member function is called from the instantiated object. So again, if I just create some pointer to some base type and then later say equals new whatever that drive type is, then I need to make sure that that drive type is calling the correct functions. Okay, so that's what virtual is here. All right, so let's go to a 400 question, get a little bit trickier here. And what is a V table? All right, give you a moment to think about that. Use your context clues from the previous section, perhaps. Let's go ahead and take a look at the answer. So the V table contains entries in a class for each virtual function call. Okay, so that thing we just talked about in the previous uh, lesson there. Um, so basically, per class that you've created, there's one V table. Usually it's a pointer at the bottom uh, of the class. So here's a base class, here's a drive class, for instance, and you'll have a V table here that's storing which member functions to call. Okay, so that way we can make sure we call again the right function for each of these classes here. All right, excellent. All right, so let's go ahead and do the last question in this category. We'll take 500 for uh, the class's inheritance and ask you what is virtual inheritance in C++. Okay, this is from a more recent video. Hopefully you've been keeping track in the series and watch that before this one. And let's go ahead and see what the answer is. Hopefully you're right. So the answer is virtual inheritance ensures that you have a derived class that only contains one of the base classes uh, if it appears multiple times. And this is one you might have to draw out and think about. But if you remember or recall back to the dreaded diamond inheritance problem, our lowest class or you know the subclass 
um, in that diamond pattern would have two potential copies of the base class at the top of the diamond. So we need to make sure that we only get one copy and using virtual inheritance is a way to ensure that happens. Okay, so you can take a little review here if you want, try to draw it out and see why this makes sense uh, or review the last video in the playlist if you'd like to see a concrete example. All right, we are down to our final category here, just miscellaneous class things, questions that have gotten an interview. So let's see what we have here. So for 100, describe a strategy to prevent copies of objects from being made. Hmm. All right, so hopefully you thought about it and there could be at least two answers. Maybe you came up with one of two. So in C++ 11 and beyond, you can just use the delete keyword to delete the copy constructor and avoid copies from being made. Whether that's doing the uh, initialization of objects by copying them or passing uh, by value uh, objects into functions that would avoid copies from being made. Now, if you want, you can also just make the copy constructor private. So you can either define it or just leave it empty or whatever. And that'll also prevent the copy constructor from being called because it'll be encapsulated in your class. All right, for 200 here, why should you use a member initializer list? And this is different from just a initializer list. So make sure that those are two different ideas that you understand. Why should you use a member initializer list? Well, let's take a peek at the answer here. Well, when we use a member initializer list, you can avoid making copies because you can just directly instantiate the object by constructing whatever that member variable is inside the object. And if you need proof of this, we have a video in the playlist that, again, hopefully you've watched, uh, where we actually track the number of allocations that were being made. So member uh, initializer list can be great for performance. Now, again, um, if you're used to creating a constructor where you take in a parameter, so that's passing in, creating a copy, and then you do an assignment, um, you can just avoid that whole hassle. Okay, it'll clean up your code a little bit uh, as well. All right, let's go ahead and move halfway through this category. We'll take classes miscellaneous for 300. What is a friend class? Well, maybe you'll recall friend functions somewhere in your study. What is a friend class? And if you've paused and thought about this, as you've been doing, if you've made it this far, well, again, similar to friend functions, but a friend class, when declared, gets access to all, including the private member variables um, of a class. Okay, we're sort of saying, hey, it's a friend class, so we trust it, and we want to give access to all the internal data. All right, classes for 400 here. Why would you make a class or a classes destructor virtual? And this is one of those questions that tends to, again, show up on interviews to test people's C++ uh, knowledge. Why would you want to do this? Hmm. Well, the answer is, again, if you've thought about this, uh, or if you've quickly reviewed a video in our playlist, is in general, if you have a base class, and so you're deriving some other class from it, like in this example here, here I've got a derived class from some base class, using the virtual keyword on the base class essentially ensures that it gets called. So if I'm doing something like this at line 34 here, where I'm just saying, hey, here's some pointer to anything that is a, or in this family of base, so derived is part of that. And I create this new derived function. As soon as I delete this object, I want to make sure that I call the right destructor. Uh, and right destructor in this instance means the derived class and then the base class, because both could have allocated memory. Okay, so we need to make sure that we free all of our memory um, in that way. Because this sort of makes sense, because when I create this object, well, it's going to be constructed from, well, all the things in the base class and the derived class. So when we destroy it, we need to make sure that uh, by making the base class destructor virtual, both of those destructors get called. Okay, so if you know you're going to be using inheritance in this way, always make your destructors virtual. 
All right, let's go ahead and take this to 500 to finish off the category, Classes Miscellaneous. How do you make an abstract class in C++? Hmm. All right, so go ahead and think about this for a little bit. Has something to do with, well, hopefully you've thought about it. Let's go ahead and take a look. Has something to do with that virtual keyword. So here's an example here. But the truth is we don't have abstract classes in C++. There's no keyword for it, uh, essentially. But we can create these sort of interfaces by creating pure virtual functions by making these virtual void and then assigning them to zero. This means that any class that derives from I renderer here must implement draw and update. Okay, and that essentially gives us an abstract class that must be implemented. So if you're coming from languages like Java or C Sharp where you have interfaces uh, more clearly defined, this is how we do things in C++. All right, let's go ahead and return to our Jeopardy board. Are we done? No, we're not done. We have one more question um, to do here. So we always finish off with a final Jeopardy. And the topic, of course, is going to be about classes. That's what this review is. Um, so let's go ahead and see the question. All right, so why is this not a reference? And I'll go ahead and give you a few moments to think about this. And you can play through the Jeopardy song in your head. But why is this not a reference? And if you've thought about this for a little bit, the answer comes from Bjorn Strusup himself. And he says, because this was introduced into C++, really into C with classes, before references were added. <laughs> OK, so you can imagine that. Also, I chose this to follow the simula usage rather than the later small talk use of self. OK, so a little bit of history there. That's why this is um, a pointer. It might have been better if it was a reference um, so you couldn't sort of misuse it. Or, um, But again, this is what we're stuck with in the C++ language. Hopefully, this also makes you think about or recall the this pointer here. All right, folks, so with that said, let's go ahead and return back to our board here. Hopefully this was a useful review and you've enjoyed our little Jeopardy exercise here. So folks, uh, I hope you had fun with that. I know we didn't get to do this as interactively maybe as you um, would, but maybe you can do this with some friends or maybe this is just going to be helpful interview prep for you if you're doing a C++ style interview. And if you'd like, maybe we can get some C++ experts to just discuss some of these things uh, in the future. So definitely comment below if you'd like to see that, or if you'd like to see more of these review type of videos just as we move along in the series. Sometimes it's nice to take a pause and do that. So if you made it to the end of the video, definitely comment below and let me know what your score was in Jeopardy. Um, I'm sure you knocked out of the park because I'm sure you're subscribed and watching those videos. <laughs> All right, folks, thanks for your time. Hope you enjoyed this. I had a blast making it and we'll see you in the next video for some more fun content.